Good morning. Welcome to the uh, podcast. It's Thursday, Thursday morning in mid June, and today we're going to look at a poem by William Blake. So it's a poem that uh, I hear often in podcast teachings given by Lama Surya Das. Right? So this is a series of recordings taken from retreat Dharma talks that Surya Das has given over the last decade or so. Um, I started listening to them a couple of months ago. Uh, there's about 90, 95 episodes out there. Um, so, you know, close to 100 hours of, of teaching available um, on, on podcasts. Right? And they're, they're really, really good. Um, he'll talk for 20 minutes or so and then and then take questions. So you can tell that, that there are in different points of the retreat. I think it's usually an eight-day retreat. Um, and there's a fair amount of repetition, right? Because he's day one of a retreat. He te- teaches the same stuff. And, and you can tell that these podcasts are taken from sequential you know, retreats over many, many years. And day one material is roughly the same each year, but with always a different context and different prism. So they're quite wonderful. And I've really, uh, it's felt like an extended retreat myself for the last six weeks or so. I've been listening to one or two of these a day when I'm out, when I'm out walking. And, um, you know, it's different from, different in some ways from the Bon Buddhism that I'm, that I practice, uh, Names are different. Some of the exercises are different, um, but uh, but Tibetan Himalayan Mahamudra Dzogchen teaching uh, is kind of a tradition in itself. That I I don't know. It, it maybe even precedes Buddhism, or you know, predates Buddhism, or is a separate genesis of Buddhism. Uh, just as Bon itself predates Buddhism in Tibet, um, perhaps this idea of um, the immediate availability of enlightenment, the natural state of Buddha, is certainly in the historic sutras, the teachings of Buddha. Um, but my current understanding, which is always limited and hopefully progressing, but, but limited, my current understanding is that if you read the Pali scriptures or the original discourses, um, the bulk of that, and, and certainly the easiest to get from that, is the, is the gradual path of uh, progressive uh, purification of wisdom, action, meditation, the Eightfold Path unfolding, um, leading gradually over the course of many lifetimes to a, to a bodhisattva, to an enlightened mind. Okay, as opposed then to, well, not as opposed to, but, but along with Dzogchen, which then is this idea of uh, the uh, essential natural state, always present, um, waiting to be recognized and then stabilized and then acted upon. And I think this is where the poem comes in because how do you act upon the awareness of Buddha, 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 Buddha within, Buddhism within, Buddhas, um, and uh, this is not an easy question or easy, easy answer. And where I'm at with it right now, and again, this is, this is always my stumbling attempts to understand the practice and the experience. 
um, with with the awareness of of Buddha nature and the concurrent understanding of emptiness of self. Mm. Emptiness of self. We spend a lot of time talking about that. The emptiness of self does not m- imply the unreality of self or the meaninglessness. There's not a swerve towards nihilism when we talk about the emptiness of self. It, it is the recognition that there is no self-sustaining self. There is no, and that is deliberately solipsistic. There is no force. That, there, there, there is nothing that inherently demands the presence of the ego self. And that this is a, a construct that is present, m- real, material, but on scrutiny um, is and is dependent and conditioned. So there is no independent, unconditioned self, I think is how we should hear the impermanence of self. Um, so given that, um, experiencing that, acting from that, how do you act from that? And the four measurables, loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about these along with these teachings from from Surya Das. My own practice within Omo Ling and within Born is very focused on understanding the connection and necessity, necessity of those four immeasurables. And the the way that they can unfold. So the William Blake poem. Here I'm. However many minutes in, I haven't even read the poem yet. So here's the poem, William Blake. Uh, we all know William Blake from Tiger Tiger, Burning Bright. Uh, we might know Blake from Jerusalem. Uh, and probably know Blake from this poem as well. It's quite famous. He who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. He who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. So there's so much in that poem, but I'll start with three things. Um, the, The binding to joy, the kissing of the joy and eternity's sunrise. So binding to joy is, is, is the attachment, which is always what brings chaos and suffering. It's our attachment to ideas. And those ideas may be negative. We think of being attached to vices or addictions. But attachment applies equally to the the positive outcomes of the practice and the positive aspects of our life. Um, Joy must be allowed to fly like winged life. And if we grasp it, demand that it be present, um, wish that it be present, uh, it will evaporate like a butterfly that you try try to grasp. This does not mean that we should not aspire towards the virtues. Aspiration is different from from attachment. Um, He who kisses the joy. So joy is one of the four immeasurables, right? Loving kindness, compassion, which is skillful means joy, the desire that all beings have happiness, the cessation of suffering, freedom, <coughs> joy. So the, 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 the joyful life that Blake is referring to here is one that is um, immeasurable in its perception. 
Eternity Sunrise. Uh, I hear that and I think of the natural state of the unfolding Buddha nature within. Uh, Eternity's Sunrise. Um, Surya Das riffs on this very nicely, right? The ever, and I think he's taking it from Chogyam Trumpa, I think. Uh, not just Eternity's Sunrise, but the eternal sunrise, the ever rising sun in the East as a metaphor for Buddha nature, as a metaphor for natural state. But what that what that can refer to then is the the sun doesn't rise. The earth is moving around the sun. Eternity's sunrise is a recognition of the shift of perspective. The other thing that Surya Das talks about often in those teachings as a, as a metaphor in the physical world that can help us understand some of this. It's the idea of a rainbow. Just the, right, so we think of a rainbow. There's no pot of gold at the end of a rainbow, he will say, because when looked at from above, a rainbow is a circle. Get the fuck out of here. Isn't that amazing? I mean, some, so many things that I don't know. Um, but there you go. Um, he who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. He who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Mm. So, thank you for listening. Um, any questions, drop me a note, zenglop at gmail.com or in the comments, either in the podcast app here or on YouTube. Um, and if you're on YouTube, definitely subscribe and like and do all that, do all that, do all that good stuff. Keep your wits about you.